Tonight's live stream is produced by Audio Events and sponsored by Atlantic Broadband. Get fast business internet and phone for so much less. Other. I've been a, a social advocate my entire life. I have the opportunity to use all my business experience, all my personal experience, all my government experience, and do something that's going to last. WABAM is a nonprofit organization that provides services to children and adults with autism and intellectual disabilities. When you have staff working three different shifts, 24 7 support is what these folks need. The only way you can do that is with technology. Whether it be an electronic health record, whether it be a payroll record, having an information highway connecting over 25 satellite locations, making sure that information is available is essential. And we didn't have that before. Who steps up? Who's going to help? Who's going to go above and beyond? Atlantic Broadband has done that for us time and time again. WABAN has blossomed into this organization now that over the course of one year supports over 3,000 people in Southern Maine. We cannot do this by ourselves. Without the efforts of the community, without partners like Atlantic Broadband, this work would not be possible. I am incredibly proud, honored, and humbled to be part of this work. probably hear me when this comes in, but for some reason my camera is uh, being extremely sluggish, and hopefully that catches up. Uh, it wouldn't be a live night with the Barrington Chamber of Commerce without a few technical glitches, because we've had them every week so far. Uh, anyways, uh, my name is Mike. I'm the chairman for the Greater Barrington Chamber of Commerce, and I am joined tonight by two other board members, actually, but more importantly, they are realtors in our local real estate market. Um, and we want to talk to them tonight about how COVID is um, affecting or not affecting the real estate market. So I'd like to bring in and welcome uh, Peter Dealey of Coldwell Banker and Maria Schutt of uh, Remax on the Move. Welcome, guys. Hello. Hello. <laughs> my way. My <laughs> how you guys doing? <laughs> Good. How are you? Fantastic. So tell me, I mean... What first? Let me start with each one of you. Get to know you guys a little bit more, and you know maybe our viewers might want to know a little bit more about you. Uh, neither one of you started your careers in real estate. I mean, you've had other careers. So, Maria, what did you do before you were in the real estate market? I was, I was a, a road, road warrior. warrior. I, was I was a sales, sales rep, rep for industry, industry selling to industry. industry. So, so um, I, I, I was, was that, that person that left, left on Sunday and, and got, got home, home late, late on, on Friday, Friday night. night. And, and when, when uh, the, the economic, economic downturn, downturn the last, the last uh, big, big one, one hit, uh, the business I was involved in, um, the, writing the writing was on the, was wall, on the wall, wall that that it probably wasn't going to make it. So I thought long and hard about uh, finding a career that utilized my skill set but allowed me to sleep in my own bed every night. Um, and I... I, I and it eventually boiled down to real estate. Um, I hadn't thought about it, but somebody put the bug in my ear and um, it turned out to be a pretty good fit. Ten years later, um, I'm with the same um, franchise that I started with, although our agency has been purchased by a number of, um, has has evolved. We've been three different names. Um, uh, and I'm uh, real recently was... Uh, Awarded a Hall of Fame award oh, from Remax. Thank you. What was that for? Uh, that's for um, uh, earnings that exceeded, I think, a million dollars. Fantastic. Good for you. Awesome. Thank you, Peter. What did What did you do before real estate? So I was a builder for twenty five years. Um, I started out when I was in high school and college, working summer during the summers for a couple carpenters in the small town I grew up in in central Maine. And I, uh, I 
you know, I was a subcontractor. I, I was a contractor. I started my own company, Lamprey River Construction, when I moved to when I met my wife. Um, in 2005, I was the builder of the year for the, for the Seacoast uh, National Association of Home Builders. So I was pretty successful at it, and I really enjoyed it. You know, I did a lot. I specialized in remodeling, which really gave me um, knowledge of all the different eras of homes that we have in this area. The oldest home that I remodeled was built in 1750, and um, I built a new house um, in 2007. So, and, and I worked on homes all throughout the, that vintage. So for me, um, real estate is a natural fit because I really know my product. And, and I know all about the different eras of housing we have here. Um, why I chose real estate was because over the years of working as a contractor, I really hurt my back. And I had a torn ligament and a bulging disc and a lot of muscle problems in my lower back. I was actually in Home Depot or Lowe's one night, as I often was, you know, like 10 o'clock at night, getting supplies for the next day. And I saw this guy who was like 70 years old pushing the cart around with a miserable look on his face. And I really had this kind of like, you know, epiphany moment where I said, that's going to be me. That's where, that's where I'm headed, you know? So I, 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 and I, and I had a back injury and I needed to do something about it. And really that the, um, you know, the, the neurosurgeon I saw and the physical therapist I saw said, you got to change what you're doing or that that's exactly right. You're going to end up a miserable old man. And, you know, I wasn't into that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I started looking around and it really, really real estate was a good, really an excellent fit for my skill set. Awesome. So, you know, one thing I've been asking it, people that join me, um, you know, I kind of half expect that a lot of people have maybe some downtime. It doesn't sound like that may, is, the, is the case in real estate, but have you, have either of you learned a new skill since the coronavirus and the COVID-19 pandemic? I've leaned into the technology a whole lot more than I did before. I mean, essentially, any realtor will tell you at, at its core, real estate is a whole lot more about people than it is about the product. Mm -hmm. um, and and so always emphasize being with the people as much as we could. And that's just not possible right now. So technology that's been available to us for a long time, I think Pete will tell will agree that we we have to lean into the technology. We have to do everything virtually or as much as we can virtually. Well, like we're doing tonight and like we have been doing. So um, absolutely. Yeah. And I think the um, you know, the great thing for Marie and I is that we've been using this technology for a long time in many ways. We haven't really been doing the Zoom meetings, but as far as you know, we, we use uh, um, programs to get things signed electronically. We deal with out-of-state clients all the time, so we're, we're really good at that. I think the, the one thing I've learned is, and Maria mentioned it, is that I like to be with my clients or, or people when I'm showing my properties. I like to be there, and, and we really have to back off on that face-to-face -face interaction a bit. And uh, I guess I've learned to manage that a little bit, and it's, I've, actually it's freed up some time for me. So, yeah, to, to, ahead, to, 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 to be introduced to somebody now, it used to be always about coordinating when you could actually physically meet. Yeah. And right now it's easy to meet with people because, <laughs> because right. everybody's got a half an hour in the course of the day where they're happy to take your call just like as we are right now. Yeah. So I, I got to get right into this. You know, as, as someone that's not in the business, it's somewhat shocking to me that the, the real estate market seems to still be on fire. Um, I actually was hoping to have other real estate agents with us tonight and do like more of a, a big panel. Um, we have several other members and uh, all of them got back to me and said, you know what, I've got showings or I'm busy, you know, but the, the market's on fire and, and they're busy. So um, why do you think that is? I mean, as, as a Again, as someone that's not in the business, I would think right now is the absolute worst time to put your house on the market. I'll take that. It's all about scarcity. Um, we've got we've got tremendous incentive for buyers 
to buy now in the form of extremely low interest rates. Um, we have been underbuilt as a marketplace for the last four years. So this is just what COVID has done is compound that. Um, some buyers dropped out, some sellers dropped out, but the overall effect is that there are, there are still so many more buyers than there are sellers. Sellers have so much control right now. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. I can add some uh, data to that. I mean, for decades, people have been moving up here, up here from Massachusetts, right? And in the last 10 years, the job growth in the greater Boston area, they've added 245,000 jobs, okay? These are folks who can now afford a house. And in the last 10 years, the number of housing units has only increased by 71,600. So we're, at, as Maria said, we're just at an extreme shortage before COVID even hit. Right. And now that COVID's hit, especially this time of year, when we typically see a really rapid increase in the number of listings in the spring market, those, the number of listings has, has you know, dropped dramatically. Um, so, for instance, today I looked at the MLS for New Hampshire before we got on, and today in Barrington we have 15 single-family residences for sale. Three of those are new construction. Those are, those are ones that are active listings, not under contract. 15. In 2014, we had 125 listings in Barrington. Wow. So uh, the towns that surround us are, are lower. Lee has eight listings. Nottingham has 11. Stratford has seven. Northwood has 10. Durham has eight. So it's, it's just so low that anything that's been, anything that's decent and priced right has been selling very rapidly. Um, perhaps the number of overall sales is down because we don't have a lot to sell, but prices are rising. And there is data on that, too. Um, the New Hampshire Association of Realtors just released some figures a, a few days ago. The year over year, last April to this April, um, the uh, volume for the state, this isn't hyper local, but it is the state, is down 10 percent. So 10 percent fewer units were sold closed this April versus last April. But the median sales price is up almost 12%. Ooh, so wow. it's con it's contrary to what I think the, the, the natural intuition of would-be buyers is thinking, which is, oh, nobody's going to be out in the middle of a pandemic trying to buy a house. I could get a deal. And then the figures so far are not supporting that. No, no, no. Are you going to? <laughs> are you feeling like sellers are not listing because they feel like they can't get the price? I don't think it's about the price. I, no. That, I think, is about COVID. Yeah. They, what, what we they have they to want do people to in show house. a house, in order for our buyers, first of all, we're doing everything we can to not have a lot of buyers go through a property, um, even if it's vacant, but especially if people are living there. We want you to... We want you to um, tour the, you know, all of the online uh, tours that are available. We want you to do a drive-by. We want you to figure out, we want you to be darn close to saying, this is my house and I'm ready to make an offer before you step foot in a house. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's increasingly difficult to view that house, but from a seller standpoint, think about it in the midst of, uh, in the midst of a pandemic, you've got to, be able to say, hey, I'm, I'm comfortable with people coming through, even with those precautions. And a lot of people aren't. They just aren't. They want they they say, I'll wait. And that's very understandable. You yes. Know, strangers coming in. Um, but, you know, we are taking precautions. We're wearing gloves and masks. We're only letting um, the buy the direct buyers in. No, you know, no extended family or friends when they come to see a house. No kids. Uh, <laughs> no kids. I did a home inspection in, or I was with a home inspection in Rochester yesterday morning, and 
we all had to wear masks and gloves and we had to wipe down. We were asked to wipe down anything that we touched inside the house. And we respected that. Uh, we do have a question from Carlin. Uh, are you guys doing a lot more virtual showings? Is that a thing? Well, when you asked earlier on, what are you what are you learning? What have you learned in all of this? It's how to make your listings uh, shine yep. um, 360 degrees. And there have there have right. always been there have always been tools to do that. Um, but I think a lot of agents reserved it for those properties that were considered high end um, because it's an investment, a, a 360 degree tour. If you bring someone in to do it, it's it's upwards of two hundred and fifty dollars to have that done. Increasingly, I know my my uh, franchise just invested in uh, technology that allows that gives that to us that ability. Um, but it's but that's it's not reserved for the high end properties anymore. It's expected on every property. Yeah. 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 I agree. Are you doing virtual showings? Yes, and I've been using uh, like Matterport, um, you know, 360 scans for a long time now. Um, that's one of the things I said, you know, we've been using a lot of these tools for years, but um, today they're just, it's so much more important to have them. Um, I remember once I saw the house in uh, Lee, actually, and the buyers came from Washington, D.C. They, they looked at the 3D scan that I had attached to the listing. The wife flew up. And uh, she said, this is the house I want to, we, they put in an offer. We, you know, the husband signed stuff remotely with electronic signatures. He only saw the house in person at the final walkthrough, which was, you know, an hour before they actually went to the closing. And, you know, I, I was walking through the house with this guy and pointing stuff out to him. And he started pointing stuff out, little details that I really had not paid attention to. But he'd been on that 3D scan so much that he was so comfortable because you can really zoom around. You right. can you can look at the ceiling, the floors. You know, if you see something that's, you know, a discoloration in a wall or whatever, you, you can zoom right in on it and check it out. And so he was showing me things on and the first time he was actually stepped foot in this property in Lee uh, that I didn't actually know about. They're, you know, just small details. It didn't matter on anything, but it just it really proved to me at that point which was a couple of years ago, that these tools are super powerful, but today they're essential. You can't do it without it. Oh my gosh. Um, what has your experience been with uh, buyers getting their mortgages? You, you mentioned that interest rates are still at an all-time low, um, but has there have banks tightened up at all? Well, lenders are tightening up, yeah. They're, um, what we I've seen a number of fall-throughs, uh, reported because there was some interruption in the um, in the buyer's employment due to COVID. Uh, so things have fallen apart for that reason. They've also increased uh, um, credit score requirements. So yeah, there, there's, I think that is a little bit bouncy on the lender's side and it's reactive. I think, again, the government's going to step in and do what they can to alleviate those concerns because my standpoint is the federal government's doing everything they can to um, to to stable to, to avoid fear driven decisions in the real estate marketplace. Well, in the real estate, the, the crash of 2008 is still in the back of everyone's minds, so Oh, that's, that's very fresh. Yeah, that's, that's true. But you have to remember that that crash was caused by the housing market and all the shenanigans that went on with the subprime lending. So we people do remember that. But so but that time around and they, and they remember why it was because of the housing market this time around is due to a virus. And we do have lots of concerns about that. But the housing market. The, the, the data that I see coming out is that the housing market is going to help us come out of this, this temporary recession that we're in right now. You don't, you don't think unemployment could have an effect on, on de defaults and, and thus, again, ca causing some kind of uh, trickle effect into the, the housing market? 
Long term <laughs> unemployment sure could. Sure. Yeah, it do, but and and we don't know what's going to happen next year or the year after. We know what's happening right now. And I always say that right now I'm talk, talking to a lot of folks and I use this, this logic is that we know what's happening right now. If you want to sell your house, now's the time because this could turn into something bit worse. We could have a resurgence in the fall. We could have, you know, some really severe economic downturn because of all this unemployment. If you know, if if we can't come out of it, if we don't reopen and and uh, get back, you know, to somewhat a normal economy, it's it's going to be with us for a while. Cool. Yeah, I mean, I I, I saw um, uh, an article, I think it was yesterday, um, by a source called Market Watch that I follow, and they they had said that. Um, mortgage forbearance was up to, I think, 8.16%, which was up from a month ago at 7%. So, um, and when, and right now, I think New Hampshire, I don't know about the federal government, but New Hampshire has said that there's no foreclosures for at least three months. But at the, at the end of this, if people haven't been paying their mortgages, they've got to come up with three months worth of a mortgage payment, correct? No, not necessarily. I think... I think that if you'd asked that question three weeks ago, the answer for all the government-backed loans was yes. Um, if you, as of, I don't know, earlier this week or late last week, um, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac uh, government-backed loans have, have uh, announced that forbearance can now, the amounts for foreborn, whatever the correct term is, can be applied <laughs> the end of the uh, loan term. So they're just extending the loan term by that amount? By, by however many months. Yeah, exactly. That's good to know. So yeah. it's, uh, it's a gap in payment versus a, a pile up. Right. Yeah, and that's exactly right. Like Maria said, the government can't, can't let that happen or it will be a disaster. Um, my concern is that, the, that if, if these, some people aren't going to get back to work, and it's not going to matter if their, you know, their loan gets extended and with more payments on the end of it, they're going to need still need to make those, you know, existing payments when when they can. If they don't have a job, that's going to be an issue. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I keep looking into my industry, the events industry, and it was the first one to disappear, and it looks like it's going to absolutely yeah. be the last one to come back. So, uh, there's that's a two trillion We're dollar industry. To reinvent you. We're going to have to reinvent you, Mike. <laughs> Well, that's why I'm doing these live streams. I'm, I'm learning something new with this, and I don't know. This, this might be something for me. Uh, the next question from Facebook, uh, what would your recommendation be for a buyer that is selling and buying at the same time? Any advice? List your property first. List the property first. Yes. We, this you know, three days. If you put it out, out there that, you know, you put it right in your listing that you have to find suitable housing, but the problem comes when you try to buy. If you put in what's called a home sale contingency, you're, you're up against people who, uh, I, I, I was showing some buyers a house yesterday and today it has 11 offers on it. So if you're, you know, if you're looking to buy a house and you're up against 11 other offers and you're trying to stick in and say, hey, I have to sell my house before I can buy your house, you're not even gonna get considered. <laughs> You, you just became the twelfth option. Yeah, right. <laughs> awesome. yeah, yeah, that that's that's tough to do. In a what well, it's been tough to do all along. It's now yeah, sure. that much tougher. That much tougher. What it, what are you seeing for the types of? I mean, there there are a lot of young young people out there still um, and a lot of people that are delaying their weddings I, I know for a fact so they have money that they may want to go out and buy a house instead um, you know what are you seeing are there are there still options for the you know the first time home buyer for the entry level the starter home so to speak well that's one of the most competitive markets out there I, yep. be, I 20 minutes before I I got home tonight after going to a, a property in Rochester that was priced under two hundred thousand dollars <clears throat> um, she listed it last night and she's been showing it every half an hour. Yeah. All day today. Wow. <laughs> All day today. 
Yeah. That's what that's that's the level of competition for that for that um, price of home for that that level. Anything under two hundred and fifty thousand, that's you know move in ready, is highly competitive. Yeah. So we we have to do our best to move those first time buyers down the learning curve as fast as possible. And they'll probably lose out on a few homes before they realize that they got to be serious and, and step up their offers and be ready when they see something that they really like, be ready to jump on it. And to put their best foot forward. And that's jumping on it sight unseen in many cases, right? No. Not first time buyers. No, they're not prepared to do that. Yeah. And they, no, they it's can't. rare that a seller is going to take a sight unseen offer anyway. But here's who the first time buyer is competing against is the cash buyer. Yeah. And and somebody who says, okay, I'll I'll buy this, I'll um, put some lipstick on it, I'll I'll upgrade, I'll do a lot of upgrades because the the buyers that have lived here for 12 years didn't do that, um, and and maybe I'll live in it while I do that, and a year or two from now I'll sell it for a great profit. Okay, good to know. Um, anything else we should know about? And I want to go to Facebook um, and see if there are any other questions. I, I haven't seen any roll in. Um, but uh, if, there, if anyone out there has a question, please uh, type it in the comment section and we'll ask that. What else, what, what kind of, what other information is good information to have for buyers and sellers out there that maybe we haven't covered? Um, specific information? I I would just encourage people to think about what their short and midterm real estate plans were and maybe something that was midterm you move it up bump it up to short term um depending on you know what the other side of that looks like for instance pizza you know maybe if you're thinking about retiring and moving to Florida in 2 years maybe you sell the house now and rent for 2 years yeah, um, because it's because there's an awful lot of um, there's an awful lot of interest in yeah. your property now. And and Pete said it, we don't have a crystal ball. We don't know if two years from now it's greater demand, lesser demand. Um, my my best feeling is that interest rates can't stay this low. That much longer, but I would have. I would have told you the same thing two years ago. So, right. Right. yeah, sure. <laughs> um, you know, the the getting is good right now. We don't know what it's going to be one year from, getting, now, from now, three years from now. Right. So the interest rate is is good, but you're 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 paying more for a house essentially because there's less there's there's more demand and less supply. So being a seller right now is a great time. Being a buyer is a great time for the interest rate, but not necessarily for the price. You know what? I ha I'll ask Pete to see if he agrees. What I haven't seen during COVID is that steady uh, continuing to push the envelope on the listing side of prices and values. I've seen homes listed at more conservative prices because what is getting tougher <clears throat> are the appraisers. That's because right. There, because there is that sense of, Oh, I don't know what a year from now is going to look like. Let's get a little more conservative because they work on behalf of the lenders. Right. Yeah, um, that's right. So the appraisers have to use past data. You know, Marie and I can see what's happened in the last month with the, this just extreme demand. And you know, when I'm selling a house, I do my very best to to get the most value for my seller. But if I get too much and it doesn't appraise, then we got to renegotiate after after the appraisal doesn't come in. So that that's right. You can't push it too much. And I'm I've been showing a lot of buyers around the last couple of weeks. I do see a little bit where people are. I'm, I'm concerned that they've gone a little too far. They think they're getting greedy and thinking that you know, well, I could just sell my house for whatever I want. And you know, maybe. <laughs> Can, but then then you might have some problems after at the end of the contract yeah so. for, for three years we've been steadily pushing value on the on the listing side and and getting away with it i i think since the onset of covid um i don't think we're going to get away with that and yeah. and i 
And what I and I think I'm not the only one in that boat because the listing prices haven't continued to escalate. In my, in my opinion. Yeah, just a side note, one of the things the appraisers are doing now is uh, drive-by appraisals. You know, we used to have to let them in the house and, and all that. And really, as long as they don't they don't see a, um, you know, a huge disparity in, in something with that when they're looking into the details, they can do a drive-by or, or an appraisal at their desk. So the, so the way we're doing things is really changing right now with, um, you know, social distancing in all aspects of the, uh, you know, the whole sales process. Peter, do you think that's because they are also looking at the 3D models or the... the yeah. Aging, what, what, that's, that's how they're doing the appraisals? Yep. Yeah, they're looking at, they're looking at more detail on the listing photos and, and the other stuff. And as like I said, as long as they don't see something, you know that's really going to cause a problem and they think it's going to come in at value. They're doing a drive by or maybe even just at their desk and appraisal. So I think it's because they don't want to go in the houses. That's exactly right. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think it's because they have is more it speeding up the process. Us. It's because they don't want to go in. Yeah, it is speeding up the process. It's like a, it's eliminating that entire uh, appraisal step where, and that's what I was saying, like some of these things, we talked about in the beginning how this the, the 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 way we're doing things is changing a little bit and it's freeing up some time for me. I mean, uh, you know, I just sold a house in Rye and I didn't have to go to drive down there and let the appraiser in, hang out with the appraiser for an hour in the house, and then drive back. You know, literally that was probably over two hours on a on a normal you know pre COVID sale, but during COVID it saved me that time. Do you? Th think this will change the way the real estate market does business in the future do you think some of these tools will stick around and the processes like like these you know appraisers using the you know using the 3d images probably just like it's changing a lot of other people's jobs too yeah the, the consumer's going to demand it they they our our product is so visual that they're going to become accustomed to this and you're going as an agent, you're going to be um, lesser than if you don't provide yeah. these things. Uh, right. Yes, I, I always, I've been saying this for a long time, but you know, an MLS listing and a sign in the yard and the lockbox on the door does not cut it. You can sell a house that way, but you're not going to get the best value for your client. You're not going to get them the best offer. You know, and the offer is more than just price. There's also terms. And you got to, you know, if you're getting a loan, you're under contract for an average of 45 days. So there's there's a lot to it. And if we don't do this stuff, it's we're, I don't, I feel like I'm not doing my job. Yeah. If you're not doing every everything you can to bring yeah. the largest audience that's ready, willing, and capable of purchasing, then that's right. Then you're um, then you're remiss. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we really have a fiduciary obligation to our clients, and I think Maria and I take that very seriously, but there's definitely a lot of our competition out there doesn't see it that way. Well, I don't know that I would say, I don't know if I would say it like that, but they haven't, Pete's been doing this a long time, I've been doing it a long time. The last three years have been such a great time in real estate that yeah. it attracts you know, the barrier to entry to become a realtor is not as high as I think it should be. Um, so every everybody who thinks real estate is fun yeah. <laughs> jumps <laughs> in. And I and I think. Uh, Wait, is real estate not fun? It is. <laughs> <laughs> it is, but it's not easy. I think she should have said easy. <laughs> well, they they get into it because they think it's fun and easy. You're yeah. right. I should have. Yeah. But it's not easy. No. So Maria, you're an avid gardener. I am, and I so, and like, like Pete says, I've had more time at home. <laughs> the weather hasn't been agreeable, but my gardens are gorgeous this year. Fantastic! Is that one of your favorite parts of uh, real estate, being able to see other people's gardens? Um, yeah. Well, I I neglected to say that in the beginning is one of the decision making factors. There were two big decision making factors in why I got into real estate, and one is because um, we're independent contractors. So the um, 
this may shock you, Mike, but my tolerance for um, um, a boss is minimal. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so I really, yeah. so, I, so I got to control my own destiny. Yeah. Um, that was one sleep in my own bed. And because I'm, and I got to look at other people's backyards. <laughs> that was my, right. that was one of my big driving forces. <laughs> and Peter, you uh, would normally be coaching baseball about this time of year, right? Yes, I would. Yeah. I, I coached, um, yeah, I coached my oldest son right up through T-ball through the, um, the uh, middle school team. We won the championship a couple years, and then uh, he went to he went to Cole Brown, and then I decided to stay coaching the uh, middle school baseball team until last year when my youngest son, who's six now, um, started t-ball. So I've I actually started back in the dugout that I actually helped uh, Shane Fillion um, earn his Eagle Scout badge by building. We built that as one of the dugouts at the BYA T-ball fields as his Eagle Scout project. That's cool. Many, many years ago, I was back in there last year starting the whole rotation all over again. But it's it's great. I love it. How'd you act like that, Pete? That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, one last question, Peter. You are also a member of the Barrington Lions Club, and, and the Lions have been very active uh in the community as I mean, they're always active in the community, but you know, even more so now I think with everything that's going on. And so um, you've been yeah. doing a food drive that's every right. week, right? Every Thursday we do a food drive at the Legion, right at the Legion parking lot there on uh, route nine from five to seven. And it's the turnout from the community has been fantastic. I mean, we've one not one night we collected over $700 uh, my wife and I did it uh, last week, and we had a whole truck full of food that we brought to the food pantry in Barrington. So uh, I thank all the folks in Barrington who, who have come out for that because it's important. This town this town is incredible. So I, I did a kind of off-the-cuff food drive two weeks ago um, and split proceeds between N68 Hours of Hunger and the Barrington Food Pantry. We collected over 650 pounds of food and $1,200 that we split between the two. So uh, the town of Barrington is an incredible. Uh, so thank you, everyone out there that has uh, helped out our community. Kudos to you both. Nice work. And thank you both for joining me tonight. I don't see any other questions coming in through Facebook, but I think this was a great conversation. It is still shocking to me um, how 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 much on fire the uh, real estate market is. And uh, it's I agree, it's counterintuitive. Stuff. It really is. Yeah, yeah. It, I, it just doesn't make sense to me. But but thank you so much for joining me tonight. I think it was a great conversation. Uh, a lot of good information from both of you. Um, so thank you for your time and uh, thank you all for watching uh, tonight and in the future because this will be up forever. So thank you all. Have a good awesome. night. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Pete. Good night. Bye. Good night.